received her architecture degree from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina, which is her native country. And after graduation, she studied further uh, in Argentina and also at Columbia University in New York City. She is a practicing architect, uh, has now her own practice in New York City, uh, and has had her own practice for about five years. Uh, which, as you know, is a, a, a place in which having a practice is a, well, it's a very competitive um, environment for a successful practice. Her work has been shown in major exhibitions um, around, uh, it has been published in major international architectural magazines. Uh, she has taught architectural design at a number of schools, uh, one of the campuses at the State University of New York, the campus at Old Westbury, at Yale University, at Syracuse, uh, at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, New School of Architecture there, closer to us at Miami of Ohio, and she is now Associate Professor of Architecture at Columbia in New York City. She's worked in a whole variety of places, including the Museum of Modern Art. She's received a number of grants from the National Endowment of Humanities and, uh, and a number of other organizations of that kind, including a grant to establish the first National Archive of Women in Architecture. Ms. Torrey is the co-founder and coordinator of that archive. She is author of the book, Women in American Architecture, which grew out of the exhibition for which she was the uh, director and principal organizer. And a portion of that exhibit, as you know, is on display outside uh, in the hallway. Uh, she talked this afternoon a bit on um, some feminist issues, I think related to architecture. Her topic is quite different this evening. This evening, she'll talk about the architecture of the public realm. Please welcome Susanna Torre. Can you hear me all right? Is it better this way? Better this way? Yes? Yes? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. That was a lovely introduction. Um, and, you know, though you highly recommend the um, sort of closer contact for discussion after the lecture, I would suggest very much that you stay away from me if you don't want to catch this horrible cold that I have been carrying for the past three days, but <coughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. um, you know, of course, you know, types of lectures are, are, are actually very tricky. Um, uh, you know, I do remember mumbling something about the architecture of the public realm, but, but of course, you know, I, I don't want to be in a sense misleading. The, uh, the opening of the segment of the exhibition, Women in American Architecture in Your School, in a sense marks, marks for me a very nostalgic occasion, and perhaps the title of uh, this evening's talk should be more along the lines of taking stock or possibly even, you know, just self-indulgence. Uh, it was five years ago that the exhibition opened in New York uh, City, in fact, in February 1977. And at the end of that year, I opened my, uh, my own office. Uh, next month, in fact, uh, it will be the fifth anniversary of, uh, of that event. Andrew's right, it's a highly competitive uh, situation in New York. Yeah? Are you still having trouble listening to me? Yeah? C can we do it louder than this? What happens if I hold it like this? Okay, good. Um, so as I was saying, you know, nostalgia and fifth anniversary of uh, sort of jumping into the, in the the water. And naturally, this year has been for me a year of uh, taking stock and of reevaluation. So I see the work I've done so far as existing at one level, 
within the context of architectural discourse and polemics, which center around issues of so-called postmodernism, and also the desire that um, we have felt during the past few years to define the object uh, of architectural theory and architectural practice. Um, these issues, I suppose, could be characterized as follows. First, a critique of quote-unquote sterile abstraction of modern architecture and its lack of representational and symbolic qualities. And in response to these, we have all um, created in the past five years, and I say this advisedly, um, I think that a lot of people have done, done this, a multitude of projects where the full range from the ridiculous to the sublime have had a chance of becoming immortalized, at least for the proverbial 20 minutes that Andy Warhol predicted once, maybe with buildings a little longer than that, in one sort of symbolical construct of an or another. The second issue could be described, I suppose, as a critique of the modern movement's presumed a historical position and its seeming rootlessness and uh, this resulted in a desire to recover the past, to reestablish a connection with a traditional continuum, to seek pleasure in the correct architectural quotation, and perhaps even in witty transformations of the uh, whole treasure grove of um, historical remains. And this uh, has eventually led us into what I, I fear is a similar situation to the 19th century battle of the styles and its renunciation of architectural space in favor of the bidimensional, plainer public face or mask of buildings. Um, fashionable masks, which if they could be stripped away would reveal the same kind of, the same lack of spatial differentiation and variety that we know no longer suffices to represent our condition, because in the end, the form by which space is presumed to exist is the framework of our perception of the world. Um, I'm going to have to um, to run through the uh, through the next. Uh, I, I have to create a context for the things that I want to show you afterwards, and, and at the same time, I'm acutely aware that it is um, it's a very complex issue. So, in a sense, I'm going to sound a bit perfunctory, but do please ask questions if you feel that some things are are not clear or not explained. Um, modern space is a symbolic form a synthetic compendium of the beliefs and the priorities of a society. The origins of modern space can be traced to the Renaissance invention of perspective. This invention marked the first time in the history of pictorial representation that an abstract system represented by a grid is given preeminence over objects, bodies, and the space in between these objects and, and bodies. The grid, as a measuring and proportional device, originated, in fact, in observation of the, of the human body and was actually known to the Egyptians many, many, many centuries ago. But the grid of Renaissance perspective uh, is not merely a convenient device for laying out mural paintings, gardens, or buildings the way the Egyptians did it. You know, and once these were laid out, the grid itself disappeared. Um, this grid of Renaissance perspective represents a higher order and provides a unified, constant, infinite, measurable, and homogeneous field for the correct placement of objects. The historian Erwin Panofsky 
stated that the aesthetic and theoretical space of perspective translated a sensibility of perceived space into a powerful visual symbol that could also be expressed through the laws of logic. It was the enormous cultural impact of this symbolic form that led to the far-reaching architectural consequences we now experience. Yet, in its own time, the abstract and universal space of perspective did not have profound repercussions in architecture. In painting and representation, yes, but not in architecture. In fact, it is not until um, universal space becomes the, um, the vehicle for the ideals of modern architecture that this grid finally becomes material. And uh, I suppose that I don't need to uh, show um, an image of what the domino prototype of Le Corbusier looks like, but you know, for those of you who are not architects, it was um, a really another incredibly logical device that proposed an idea of a space that was open and available to all. And this idea, in fact, um, in eventually becomes uh, refined and purified in the work of Miss van der Rohe and, and his followers. It is at this stage that it reaches a complete fruition. The abstraction of the grid is materialized and exalted through physical structure. The walls become freestanding, non-structural non screens, creating enclosures to shield the most private activities from public view. Form is now located in the object, and it becomes separate from space. The observer is no longer fixed in a single cent central and a static point of view. The observer transforms also the perceptions of space. Today, those who recognize the pernicious tyranny of structuralness produced by universal space propose a return to an earlier spatial paradigm. And these theoreticians of architecture would have us embrace uncritically earlier spatial forms while surrendering the democratic aspirations of the modern movement. Yet the failure of the modern utopia does not in my opinion, invalidate the ideal of an egalitarian society as a reality, as a political goal, and as an individual aspiration. And this democratic, egalitarian, and caring society recognizes that there is an inevitable tension and a delicate, fragile balance and an integration between seeming opposites, the individual and the collective, the old and the new, tradition and history, private gain and public benefit, personal growth and responsibility towards others, and self-consciousness, and self-consciousness, culture and nature. What is then the kind of space that best represents our society? For one, the Americans' perceptions of space developed from a confrontation with vast expanses of nature that filled with awe the first colonial settlers. It also developed from the creation of social institutions based on egalitarian agreements expressed uh, in many ways, but also in the Jeffersonian grid and the method of land division, squares of equal area for each individual. Eventually, of course, there was a pragmatic recognition of topographical features, a recognition of the special quality of each place which contradicted this utopian aspiration of equal distribution. Cooperativism appeared to combat isolation and to ensure the full participation of landholder citizens in the process of self-government. The, the space of the public road and the meeting place, as often and no, uh, as not, express this aspiration while the idea and reality of the spatial boundary continues to be redefined even in the present. For such a complex and varied society as ours, 
it is the idea of space as a matrix, which I believe best represents our condition. Architecturally, matrix space is both inclusive and critical of an architecture based exclusively into self-contained rooms. In the context of a house, for example, the size and locations of rooms within the house establish a rigid hierarchy of importance among certain members of the household. The matrix space is also a critique of the usual distinction between enclosed rooms for private activities and corridors for circulation, a spatial setup which was originally designed as I believe I said in the seminar this afternoon, to separate the household members from their higher servants. Today, this spatial form perpetuates a sharp separation between private spaces for personal withdrawal and those for forced togetherness, without the spatial thresholds to, continue, con to contribute to different shades and qualities of interaction. A matrix space is also critical of the open plan with its lack of differentiation and hierarchy. When an open plan is used for a shared dwelling, power and submission often become the means to resolve priorities and competing uses. The matrix space aims to achieve both a spatial continuity and a spatial definition and to visualize this idea one must conceive not of a single level plan, but multiple plans showing how the space is divided at different heights. One can then see that it is possible to achieve seemingly opposite objectives, that it is possible for a space to be both open and enclosed, isolated and connected, low and high, intimate and monumental. I'm going to show you a series of pictures and to open with my one of my very, very favorite buildings, a building that was designed by Lucan, the Kimball Museum, because I think that um, in spite of all words, and in spite of the fact that I was, someone warned me about not being too intellectual, um, I think that the building itself uh, shows most clearly um, uh, some of the arguments that I was trying to put forth after showing the Kimball Museum in the light of this argument, I am going to um, present some views of my own projects, both in the context of taking stock and, and evaluating them, and also seeing them in the light, in a sense, not any longer of a discussion of postmodernism, but basically as a search for which the Kimball Museum really represents a sort of milestone, you know, a point at which I would want to arrive at one point or another of my own work. Um, the, um, the first series of projects is a series of um, uh, basically renovation projects so in varying degrees of, of uh, intervention. And the last project inaugurates a series um, a, which I call the public landscape and which involves uh, the next 10 years. Um, in other words, during the decade of 1980, every year of the decade, I, uh, I will make a project um, that becomes a realistic proposal but but at the same time a visionary proposal um, as a commentary and as a, as, as a proposal for change uh, of the public landscape. Uh, so I will show you the, the, uh, the project for 1980, which inaugurates this decade-long um, enterprise. Okay, so I think we can begin to, uh, with the slides now. Um, some of you may be familiar with this building of Cannes. It's the Kimball Museum, um, and it's located in Fort Worth, um, Texas. Um, it's an art museum. And uh, 
it basically becomes accessible in two ways. From the uh, parking lot on the, um, I suppose that I could use this, let's see, on the uh, upper part of the plan, and also from these open porches into an open courtyard into the building itself. In the ground floor plan of the museum, which is actually the most important for my purposes, we see the sequence of the, uh, or the placement rather, of the stairs from the lower level parking from which one ascends into the lobby of the museum. And one also sees the, um, the courtyards. Obviously, at first glance, uh, we are looking at um, an open plan building, a sort of loft space, uh, a modern gallery space for the display of, uh, of pictures. And yet, and this is why I mentioned, you know, in, in order to be able to understand this notion of matrix space, you have to draw plans at different heights, that if one drew a plan at the level in which the vaults, which are not, as some of you may know, not real vaults, um, a close in, then each one of these spaces along the galleries would become a perfectly enclosed uh, and well-defined room. It would feel like enclosure. It is no longer a totally open um, space. The, um, the slide to the right is shown to illustrate, of course, that kind of a spatial definition that vaults in general do have. But in Kant's project, that structural notion is completely transformed. Um, in fact, that is the beam, and these pieces are attached to it. That is to say, this vault is not complete and resting on something, as it would be traditionally, but actually the vault is severed in half and light comes through it, forming you know, the famous um, uh, natural light um, uh, devices which illuminate the galleries with that wonderful um, silvery light. Uh, in fact, the, um, um, the entrance to the museum uh, is, is interesting because it emphasizes in the, uh, in the side the closeness of the vault spaces, uh, which is the opposite reading to what the structure actually is all about. And I think that I am slightly um, out of sync. Let me see if I can correct that. Okay, here is better. So, uh, although there is really no single picture that could possibly describe the phenomenon that I'm trying to convey to you, perhaps these you know, two are the, the ones that, that most accurately define it. That is to say, the possibility of having at, this, at once a space that is completely open and totally free and that feels actually quite contained. Um, and it is a really very, very special um, experience. And yet within this totally open, uh, undefined space, one can find perfectly figural uh, spaces like the courtiers and the stairs inserted, marking a very precise, very calculated um, ceremonial sequence to the space, which again is very much outside and uh, uh, beyond the logic of the open loft space of the museum. Uh, the series of uh, my own projects, which I would like to show you, begins uh, with a very small project, which um, I like using because it's, it's very easy to explain. Uh, and in a sense, it was uh, created with a didactic intention. Um, it involves the, uh, the transformation and renovation of two rooms uh, in uh, the uh, a pension building in Washington, D.C., which is the building on the right. It was a building 
built at the turn of the, uh, well, in fact, built right after the um, Civil War to dispense uh, pensions to the widows of the soldiers. Uh, the, the architect of the building, uh, General Meigs, was as much an aficionado of classicism as uh, he was of uh, technological uh, novelty. The building itself is based, uh, in fact, um, based very, very directly on the design for the Palazzo Farnese, but uh, with one important difference, which is that it was built in red brick. And, uh, and in that way, although it occupies an entire block in Washington, D.C., it was very sympathetic to the um, uh, two and three story brick houses which surrounded it uh, when it was first built. Um, of course, today we would say that it was a very contextual building. Um, but um, at the same time, this sort of sympathetic attitude, which I'm sure was also based in, in some measure of economy, caused the building to be on the verge of being demolished a great many times. And in fact, when the Macmillan Commission uh, reviewed the plan for the mall, uh, they made absolutely every effort to first have it torn down. And when they couldn't succeed in having it torn down, uh, then uh, basically excluded it from the strategy of the monuments of the mall. Although it was a, a classical building, it was clothed in Victorian uh, skin, like all the strange uh, red brick buildings of the Victorian era in, in Washington. In any event, uh, once every two years or so, the federal government stages a, um, a conference, a national conference, which they call the Federal Design Assembly. And uh, they uh, get together over a thousand employees of the federal government who do not have architectural design training, but who make decisions on a daily basis which affect the architecture and design that is produced by the government or approved by the government. So every two years or so, uh, they get their expenses paid and go to different cities. And they're literally blitz with seminars and exhibitions and site visits and um, various kinds of things. In this particular occasion, Stanley Tigerman, uh, Charles Moore, and myself were invited to provide a very unique experience for these people, which is to say to take rooms in the periphery of the um, um, the grand court that is the interior space of the building in its heyday, today is very ruined, and is scheduled to become the National Museum of Architecture. Um, but in any event, to take these rooms, and uh, we're challenged with the following. First, to provide lounge spaces for the delegates to the assembly, the only places where these people could have lunch, have their meetings, perhaps rest a bit, in, in general, where they could sort of be away from the uh, very um, um, uh, agitated you know, schedule that they had. Second, that these rooms would be exhibitions of architecture. The idea was uh, that instead of uh, exposing these people to pictures of what architecture is supposed to be about, the lounges themselves would be statements about architecture. And the third charge was that all of this would be accomplished by utilizing exclusively materials and finishes uh, and um, uh, furnishings that could be obtained through the federal, um, the General Services Administration schedule. In other words, those providers who had contracts with the government, which is a, a phenomenal kind of request, because um, for those of you who are not familiar, the, the federal design schedule, the GSA schedule, is a schedule that has both everything and nothing, you know, at once. Yeah. Um, in any event. On the left-hand side is a picture which I found while doing research on the building prior to, um, to working on the project. And it's a picture that obviously had a, a, a great deal of influence, although um, I, I did not have it present physically in front of me. It shows um, 
the connection between rooms that was intended by the architect um, when the building was first built is taken before construction. And it shows this enfilade, which was characteristic of this kind of spatial planning. In other words, two suites of rooms would be connected between them by a broad, shallow arch, and then those two, those two rooms would in turn be connected to another suite by a um, narrow arch. So, in my case, um, the, the challenge of the design was um, obviously the one posed by the issue of speaking or presenting an idea about architecture to people who are not um, trained in any way. And I think that one of the most difficult things to understand about architecture by people who are not trained, and even by some people who are trained, in my opinion, is, um, is to understand just how architectural space is shaped, modeled, and articulated by its elements. So I thought that I would make that proposal and that demonstration uh, the object of, uh, of my design. It was not the only one, because I hope that the description of this project will give you an insight of the way I go about designing other kinds of things. I won't get into this detailed explanation with the other ones. The diagram on the left um, shows that um, in one of these, uh, if you want, parallel threads, um, you know, or approaches, the room is viewed as a space defined by the structure which is contained within a larger spatial container. The section hopefully shows that, which is to say that in between the piers is the shallow vault of the room itself. So that in fact, although you couldn't tell, you know, when, when we here in these rooms, they were in really terrible shape, uh, you couldn't really understand that space in any clear sense, that in fact there is a room within a room. So, that was actually uh, articulated, uh, and the spaces, the thresholds between the room and the inside and the outside were treated as if they were very thick uh, layers of that interior or exterior wall separating and joining that room with both you know, inside and outside. Um, in the upper part of the, of the diagram, is shown then that on opposite walls, needed to say when I show you the picture of the arches, all of that had completely disappeared and little you know, rooms uh, uh, had been added beyond and little doors and so on and so forth. But um, on those two walls then, uh, mirrors are placed, uh, in this case covering one wall and in the other case in a sort of freestanding partition um, which was separated from the wall to, to allow for passage, uh, you know, to an existing door. Okay, so that is sort of like, you know, one, uh, one approach to the problem. Functionally speaking, um, the rooms um, were really, a, uh, or the furnishings were really a play on the uh, behavioral, uh, well, uh, this makes them sound like guinea pigs, but you know, on the habits and conducts of these particular groups of people. Um, I was to design the lunch for the editors and for the graphic designers. And editors are obviously people who relax after five, usually in club-like atmosphere, very intimate verbal context, drink in hand, you know, small, kinds of gatherings, uh, close contact. So they got a sort of club-like arrangement. And the graphic designers are more like architects. They have to struggle to uh, find a little bit of rest uh, in the midst of you know, longer hours. They need surfaces to put pads so that they can express their ideas. Uh, so they got two conference tables and uh, the vertebra chairs, you know, which you sort of can lean into to take a little nap and then spring right back into action when you're you know ready for it okay uh, 
Okay. However, it is quite obvious that uh, all that stuff could be removed and replaced by any number of other interpretations. Um, you know what what the um, uh, the function uh, could be about. The diagram on the left shows the third approach uh, to the problem, which really had to do with the fact that although the, the club and the conference room may have been perfectly adequate and uh, an appropriate um, uh, places for these people to get together, uh, they nevertheless did not express in any adequate way the public function of the rooms as exhibitions of architecture. So basically Basically, the, uh, the public scale is reinstated in the rooms with the use of the same um, lampposts which line the sidewalks of the streets of Washington, D.C., and which this time are brought inside. The, um, uh, the vault over the rooms of course has traditionally been a substitute for, for the sky, which in this case is simply painted to reflect the time of the day when this activity of gathering was most likely to take place. And there is a view of the, um, of the uh, finished rooms, in this case the graphic designers. And I suppose that by now it's clear that the device of the mirrors is, is in a sense a way of bringing back that space that was implicitly contained but had been totally, or the memory of which had been totally erased. And it's of course something that can only be activated by the presence of an observer. And that is uh, a view of the um, uh, editor's um, a lounge. <clears throat> now, uh, to design a space as a forceful displays of architectural creativity, which is one of the things that we were asked to do, and then to also design it so that it can be used and occupied in a relatively unselfconscious manner, which is also one of the charges that we were given. In my view, it's not like unlike walking a, a tightrope. Implicit in this lounge problem was the, uh, the ever-present dilemma that is all too superficially described as the opposition between form and function. Now, in my view, the problem is not on whether the function can be given an appropriate form, because if what we mean by function is something beyond mechanical performance, then its actualization is determined by highly idiosyncratic personal behavior and by somewhat more predictable socially acquired behavioral patterns. The question is on whether the aesthetic of architecture can support, ignore, inhibit, or even repress unselfconscious behavior in the use or occupancy of a space, or, on the other hand, on whether personal idiosyncrasy in social cliches can dismiss, tolerate, or erode the aesthetic quality of architectural space. The Italian critic Manfredo Tafuri has described this dichotomy in the following terms. He says, the Western dream of reason opposes the abstraction of form whose duty is order. To the harassing disorder of the world whose impulse is formlessness. Now, to accept the principle of disorder without cursing life by making order and disorder inseparable elements of an architectural language which speaks of this contradiction is, as Le Corbusier once wrote, a feat for acrobats. And, uh, and Corb said it himself, an acrobat is not a clown, balanced on the tightrope, risking a fall. 
the acrobat is happy to prove that the mockery of the audience perhaps can still be avoided. <laughs> this is um, uh, also the, the, the diagrams for the um, uh, for the first project for the consulate of the uh, Embassy of the Ivory Coast um, in New York. And although it's slightly different than the other representation that I showed before, uh, this is an, is an earlier project. Um, it, it basically isolates in the three drawings and then completes in the axonometric these parallel approaches which I was attempting to describe in the previous project. In the first case, the space as found in the second case, to your right, um, the, the major um, the spaces, the ceremonial space of circulation, and the space of gathering, uh, in this case, the conference room. And then uh, to the left, um, that which cannot be contained or explained by so-called functional requirements which the diagram on the right basically explains. Uh, that is to say, location of offices, uh, reinforcement of the grid as it exists, and then um, an overlay of a very different um, kind of space, which is figural and inscribed within the grid itself. So it is neither open space nor totally enclosed room-like uh, space. Um, so to your left uh, is, a, is a part of the drawing. By the way, these drawings are about, in case you're interested, uh, 9 to 12 feet long by about 4 to 5 feet high. They're very large. Um, it, this drawing records those um, aspects of the project which are done for the pleasure of representation and which had have a very specific, a specific connections with the culture, civilization, affinities of the particular client who commissions the project. Uh, from the, uh, uh, the the colors of the of the space to the um, uh, to particular representations, I, I suppose that that I could dwell in a couple of them because. I'll, I'll show you the second project, which was the one that was built, um, where that is picked up. The reason why I'm showing the working drawing is because, uh, you know, we are often, as architects, accustomed to think that the, uh, the quote unquote, the, the image should speak for itself. And, and of course, when we make working drawings, we acknowledge right away that the image uh, in itself is not sufficient to communicate a number of things about um, uh, the project. So in a sense, the drawing that I was, or the diagram that I was showing you to the left um, is also a working drawing, only that it is a working drawing of the mind rather than um, than a working drawing of how the two by fours go together and you know what kinds of things need to be put you know where. Um, but we do make drawings which need a text, need that su mutual support to be able to convey things beyond uh, the image. Um, and in the axonometric, uh, of course, you know everything sort of comes together at the reception area. You know the processional space sort of like cutting through, and in fact, one needs to deflect around the uh, um, the curb wall towards the offices with various secretaries and and um, uh, assistants to uh, uh, to the side. The two niches. Um, which really mark the gate to the space um, were to be covered with um, um, a golden uh, mosaic and in one side and a very deep blue mosaic on the other. Uh, the same mosaic which is then utilized on the wall uh, of the conference room and with a pattern which is based on a transformation of kente cloth weaving, which is really a language um, 
and the, the patterns themselves have very specific meaning. So that pattern tells a story. And uh, because you never experience it frontally, it's then adjusted to visually read as if it was a uniform grid, which of course is not true. Uh, that project could not be built because the space uh, transfer from from one to the other. You know, it's, it's interesting. Of these three approaches, there are some that can be transferred directly, and of course, others that can. The entrance to the space. The niches now become columns. Um, the uh, the uh, the columns and the colors have very specifically to do, like in the case of the niches, with the requirement uh, that all doors, the tribal requirement that all doors, doorways, and, um, and keys uh, include the carvings of the female and the male figure as the guardians of the place. And, and of course, in Western civilization, the column stands for the human body, which is now made in a sense strange or, or codified in a different way by utilizing the color assigned to female and the color assigned to male within the code of, of or the language rather of, um, of Kente. And this is uh, looking back towards the street from the secretary's area a detail of the stairs with cathode lighting inserted into a cove. Um, upstairs, this division of one room and the other, and, and a core and stairs. One of the offices and, um, uh, and a lunch room or, or solarium uh, on the other side. And then very quickly, um, another recent project, uh, a restaurant uh, in Chambers Street. Um, in the plan towards the right street, access to the apartments, uh, it is a loft building that still has residential lofts above. Um, access to the freight elevator, which is maintained. Uh, second means of egress and access to the restaurant itself. Bar on this side, restaurant on the other. Maintain, in other words, a completely open, continuous space and yet uh, manage to create um, specific instances in which transition intimacy threshold um, allow for a different reading of of this condition. Of course, um, there are other overlaid um, in intentions which are quite representational, but I was trying to describe the spatial intention of the place. The kitchen is below, um, so that in fact there is a progression from a street to garden, which is very characteristic of the experience of New York um, a loft, a loft or townhouse spaces. And in the axonometric one sees the device of the screen for the bar uh, extending the street into the space uh, and then uh, and even into that transitional space, allowing that to somehow erupt, uh, erupt uh, through the tranquility sort of loosely held by, by that node uh, into the quote unquote garden or restaurant. Uh, in the elevation, uh, the slippage of uh, a vernacular um, a store from glass building uh, behind uh, the, uh, the vernacular, quite ordinary loft building is actually suggested so that there is, in a sense, a mesh of the two vernaculars uh, of the area. There are, of course, a number of compositional conditions which uh, make that space in the middle a very important window to look into the space and outside of the space. This is the bar uh, looking towards the uh, 
the back and towards the street. And this is a restaurant. <coughs> um, quite a simple room um, with walls which are uh, treated um, both in a symmetrical and asymmetrical um, uh, fashion. Um, beyond the, uh, the screen itself um, is perhaps the most um, private and quiet a space in the house uh, as if it was in fact uh, topiary uh, shaped um, sort of private natural uh, realm um, of a very different scale uh, this is also a recently completed project the house um, which was moved um, a quarter of a mile from its former to its present location. Uh, it was a stable um, where the horses and hay were, were kept in the base of the great state in Southampton. And um, it was designed by Governor Atterbury, who was the, the architect of um, several uh, houses in Forest Hills and Queens in New York, also in, in Boston. Um, the drawing on the right um, is a reminder of some of the ideas of the projects which I'll describe in a moment or two. So uh, this is the, um, the barn, the stable being moved. And uh, although it was a gut renovation and addition of a number of uh, decks and pieces, um, one of the rules that I gave for myself, and obviously the client was very much interested in this, was that the architectural integrity of the object would be uh, indeed maintained. And in order to do that, um, the largest percentage of openings would remain in, uh, in their place and uh, the major changes would be concentrated in, in very special, very strategic places. Um, the, uh, the barn had been quote unquote houseified once and the ceiling had been added and uh, bedrooms upstairs, you know, whatever. But in any event, to the right, you have the first uh, floor plan uh, very quickly um, entrance through through a porch into a uh, lobby space um, with a wood box, um, stairs leading up, and entrance to bedroom, bedroom, mudroom, and bathroom. Uh, you will notice that the doors open towards the outside. That allows for a, a kind of detailing that uh, that produces a blind door. And um, I don't remember if I have a slide that, that shows that particular effect, but it is a rather small space with uh, a horizontal siding um, from the um, recycled pine of the ceiling that had been um, put there. Uh, but basically, with, um, it, it hides the fact that there are doors. Other than for the hinges and the doorknob, uh, you don't really see uh, the doors. And it is behind that very secret realm that uh, the private life you know, of the bedrooms basically goes on. To a very large extent, I envisioned the downstairs as a sort of basement of the house, a place of hidden things and, and very private where you know one goes to be by, one, by oneself. Um, in the upstairs uh, is the living area, kitchen, bathroom, and two sleeping alcoves to either side. Um, right above the entry, there is a porch. These faces east, and this is the east-west axis. This is north-south looking towards the sea and the bay. 
um, here a major transformation of the facade took place, which you will see in a slide in a minute. From the landing, it is possible to walk uh, on a deck and then walk right outside into the lower deck. So that, in fact, a whole ceremonial sequence is created which allows a continuity for entertaining between the spaces while at the same time not having to design spaces that are designed for the sake of impressing the guests uh, alone. Um, there again the issue of self-consciousness versus unselfconsciousness. So that for example if something uh, you know is going on on, a, on the deck as a party, people can simply go directly into it, or perhaps even from here up into the space without having to necessarily uh, enter the house itself. Is one possibility. Each level of the house, which is actually quite a small, has uh, everything that you need to be self-sufficient, so it's a house that will be very easy to share. Um, then another addition was the uh, the balcony for a chair uh, alone. Of course, more people can fit in it, but uh, that is the place where the owner uh, sits to basically stare into the horizon, sort of in a moment. And uh, if, in a sense, this is the basement of the house, I basically view this as the attic of the house. It's the place for role playing and for make-believe. Um, because the house, in a sense, is made to disappear, then um, another house is inserted, whose windows coincide with the windows um, beyond, and it is the only slick painted surface in an otherwise totally wooden environment. Something that, I'm showing you drawings that were done before the house actually was built, something that was projected, which uh, eventually was not uh, put in, was uh, these very large carousel horses that would be stripped to the wood, um, which were carved by German carvers uh, at the turn of the century, but they turned out to be extremely expensive and these clients could not afford them. So the whole question of you know the meaning of the deck had to be redefined and redesigned, as you will see. But I wanted to show you those anyway. This is uh, the house with the untouched facade looking towards the highway at the entrance. From the side, actually, you enter this way. This screen, uh, which was designed to um, to become an abstraction of an image that would continuously shift in your mind as either house, school, uh, perhaps church, even, but in a very abstract sense, um, would be eventually covered with wisteria, which is up to here now. So it, be, it would disappear, it would be taken over by nature. That is a view uh, of that entry, both uh, at night and, uh, and day. And if you look going towards the stairs at night when the glass becomes reflective and during the day when it is transparent, there is the landing from which you can go outside. And to your right uh, is a, a writing desk and counter, which can also be used as a um, buffet counter when they entertain. Um, this is a view uh, looking towards the bay on the south side. So that now, in a sense, the uh, uh, the curve of the harness is, is reinterpreted as a sort of prow, um, and the uh, west elevation, looking towards the east, the place where you came in, where this very uh, peculiar quasi Palladian window. Of course, you know, I feel that is almost sacrilegious to you know to say Palladian. You know, after that cut has been made allowing the roof to sort of, you know, come into it in a totally asymmetrical fashion. The writing desk is 
uh, on the uh, unfinished part of the window. Coming down the stairs into the uh, deck. And a view of uh, the screen at night and day and of the interior of the house. And those are the sleeping alcoves over there. Um, in a sense, I view the previous house and this house as a sort of pair, which I like calling two American homes. I think that they they deal with very two different but related um, sort of um, ideas. You know, in a sense, the, the, the first one is about um, sort of home sweet home kind of notion, and this one is about every every um, uh, how does it go? Uh, the notion of the of the home as man's castle, basically, um, is a model of it. This one, unfortunately, unbuilt, or although possibly built uh, in a slightly different and augmented version. Um, site plan which shows uh, this peculiar object. This was, of course, a very strange commission because um, the, the budget for the house so, was so unbelievably low that it forced the issue of finding uh, prefabricated components to put it together. Uh, the, uh, the client was the son of a rather wealthy man uh, who had been supporting this, this character, this 30 year old auto mechanic uh, with a collection of 15 racing cars who you know who had renounced uh, a sort of like normal way of life and allowed himself to be maintaining relative splendor um, but in any event was about to be kicked out of his parents house so so uh, sort of last ditch effort the father decides that he probably would finance his a house for him within the property, providing that the the price was, um, you know, incredibly low, and uh, in a sense, at some level, of, although of course the resolution is very different, uh, it's not unlike the problem, or you know, the, the the question of tackling this kind of problem is not unlike the problem that Frank Wright posed to himself, you know, when he began working with the Usonians. Sort of like, you know, what is it that you do to provide um, a kind of dwelling within extremely tight budgetary uh, conditions? So here, uh, the only way to go was prefabrication, and and especially of the kind that would cut down labor costs, you know, by to the absolute minimum. So, uh, with the exception of the masonry fireplaces, which, I mean, could, I suppose, have been deleted uh, in another version of the house, uh, really 90% of it is off-the-shelf uh, stuff that, that can be assembled. Um, the house is built of two wooden silos, which are still manufactured by at least one company um, that I know of and which was very near to the site. Uh, they ship you the kit with, with everything. Of course, when you work with, with a cylinder, uh, the, the, uh, the forms um, uh, are very, very clear and, and have very limited possibilities. That is to say, you have a center, a periphery, and a vertical axis. And you can interpret these either by looking at them concentrically, um, I'm sorry, uh, centrifugally or centripetally, going from the center to the periphery or conversely from the periphery to the center. So the house becomes an interpretation of each and the opposite condition. That is what the, this drawing is attempting to describe. Uh, at the entry level, the house is vertically organized in varying degrees of privacy. At the entry level, which is on the left, um, 
there is a sort of bridge and a garage door. You can drive through here, and that is a device to basically open up this interior to the outside, and there is a bath door in it. This is the pool table, storage, uh, stairs, and a sort of sitting room office uh, area. And the level uh, above that, there is pantry, powder room, a galley kitchen culminating in sort of eating counter and um, living area. Uh, standard pillar sliders open into um, uh, terraces. The, uh, the, I'm sorry, this should be switched the other way, okay, to correspond with uh, that. But in any event, in, uh, in the quote-unquote basement level, below the entry level, uh, you have mechanical um, exit to the outside, a storage, bathroom, guest, alcove, bedroom, and then, uh, and I think that this is the plan which explains the project best, in terms of you know the purity of the idea, I suppose uh, a balcony for plants and, um, uh, and and birds, which this client has right under the skylight, and then access to the outside and a widow walk around the second silo. Uh, in this silo, uh, the center is occupied by the human body. That is the axis of movement throughout the space. The silo itself is blind and light comes from above. In the second one, the center is occupied by the masonry core of um, fireplaces. The human body is displaced from the center and made to confront the world outside. Um, in the sections, one sees, I suppose, the particular profile of that uh, living space with the radial beam supporting uh, the, w the concentric walk, and the stays removed where light would be filtered and then allow the gambrel roof to sort of visually float in a space during the day. Um, the, um, uh, the elevations show that the uh, sliding doors are double doors with the mirror eyes glazed on the uh, outer glazing. Um, and this, of course, makes the bridge um, this ambiguous entity which both joins and separates the two forms um, by reflecting the landscape uh, which surrounds it. Uh, at the same time, the moment that the curve, of course, hits the glass, it tends to complete itself. Uh, the house affords a very peculiar uh, experience of the site uh, in that it is no longer a view, quote unquote, but rather an experience of seeing the trees from the ground up and then once you get to the top as basically a sea of green, green leaves. Uh, this I like showing because they were somewhat unpredictable uh, and, and not totally planned. These are the side elevations of the house and, uh, and I think that they're amusing because they reveal the um, psychological dimension of, of this particular house. That elevation being the one that faced um, the uh, client's own side of the property and that was the face of the house that looked towards the parents' house. Um, the, uh, the following project was a, an entry for a competition for a memorial for Walter Burley Griffin, designer of Canberra, capital of Australia. Uh, the, um, the memorial was to, place, to be placed on the top of Mount Ainsley in a city. Uh, which is a really rather extraordinary experiment in combining the two most prevalent um, uh, principles of 
urban planning at the turn of the century. That is to say, the principles of the city beautiful as enunciated by, among others, but most prominently by Daniel Burnham, and the principles of the concentric uh, garden cities uh, meshed in a single entity. Uh, the, fa the, the, the history of the city is absolutely fascinating, and I don't want to get into it because that in itself is a, is a very long story. But in any event, the, um, the city has two regional axes, what was called the land axis, and then the water axis, which was the floodplain of the river. Then overlaid on that, there is a close axis formed by the war memorial at that point, which is at the foot of Mount Ainsley, and uh, eventually by the um, a Parliament House, uh, well, in fact, by the Parliament House at the foot of Capitol Hill, and eventually by the, uh, a the um, Parliament House designed by um, a Mitchell Jurgola, which is uh, beginning to be built now. Uh, then this triangle forms, defines the major administrative area of the city, and from these points, then the city radiates in, a, in the autonomous neighborhoods, you know, combining these two um, close and open patterns at the same time. The organizers of the exhibition, uh, of the uh, competition, ask the um, the architects to design a memorial to, uh, to Walter Burley Griffin, but neglected to mention any homage to Marion Mahoney, who was Griffin's collaborator in the plan which won in the design for the Canberra competition, and also his wife. Marion Mahoney uh, was one of America's most uh, talented uh, architects and and uh, in fact she had an incredible talent for for drawing and for representation she is the author of over 75 percent of the wasmouth portfolio which um, it made the case for Wright's work uh, in in Europe and uh, Wright acknowledged in more than one occasion that Mahoney was his superior, superior in, in, in drawing. Uh, however, she had very few chances to be able to decide things on her own. And when uh, Wright took off with uh, uh, Mama in that uh, European escapade, uh, he left, that is to say, Wright left Mahoney in charge of the office along with von Holtz. During this period, a number of projects were designed, which von Holz and Mahoney supervised. Later on, when she married Griffin um, at uh, age 40, and eventually they go off to Canberra and they you know, get involved in the, the design and supervision of the city, and eventually in a series of projects in India, eventually Griffin dies. She writes uh, an extraordinary book called The Magic of America, which is a biography of her husband, but actually more closely an account of the years spent at Wright's own office. This memoir still remains unpublished. And in that memoir, I inserted many drawings like this one. And I'm showing it simply because of this. That part of the drawing has been erased and written over many, many, many times. Uh, at times, Marion Mahoney would, you know, write a uh, project by, you know, or architect Marion Mahoney, then she would erase that and put M.M. and von Holtz, like, below. Then that would be erased and she would attempt to rewrite her own name only, which is to say, uh, in a sense, this palimpsest created by, by the artist herself uh, is a rather anguished uh, struggle to be able to assert and recuperate her own identity um, and to assert it as, as an architect and as a designer. And it's something that she allowed herself to do and then she denied herself uh, doing. And it's actually very, very painful to see these very beautiful drawings frantically erased and, and written you know, in the corners to the point that the paper or the, or the silk uh, would be almost destroyed. Okay. 
uh, my monument um, then fulfills two purposes, or was designed to fulfill two purposes. On one hand, the monument becomes an observatory to be able to look at the city as the true monument, a monument of human intelligence and of a certain will to, to shape reality in a certain way. And that is to say, one comes um, into uh, a bridge, uh, into space, into a sort of three-dimensional facade with three windows, which aligned with the major points of the city, that is to say, you can't help but see the view in the particular way in which it is framed, and then going below to the lower level where there is this platform uh, giving into a room which has been carved uh, in the uh, side of the mountain, and in that room is Frank, um, Walter Burley Griffin's effigy. Uh, from that point, again framed by the observatory, you see the city uh, once again as a sort of abstract um, form. Um, the other purpose was to honor Marion Mahoney as the uh, person who, who carried and, in a sense, supported uh, with her work um, the, the idea of, of the city. So everything in this building uh, was designed to speak of uh, metaphors which are constantly associated with the idea of woman in Western civilization. Obviously, water, uh, circular plan, the idea of the empty house, uh, windows, passages, um, a room in the uh, in the mount the mountain is sort of um, primal refuge last century um, it, the earth as body uh, containing uh, the image um, the building uh, became in a sense uh, at least in my view uh, the closest most abstract way of expressing what the role of Marion Mahoney had been in this. And being actually rather late, I'm going to skip uh, the following one because I want to get very quickly to the last project. Oh, no, I, I did it too quickly, which is this one. Um, this, as I said before, is the project which inaugurates a decade uh, of, of projects. As proposals and speculations on the nature of the public landscape, which really in America, I believe, is, is, is the only area of speculation to, uh, to understand what is the relationship between the individual and society. And one of the reasons, but not the only one, why this is of great interest to me is because I believe that um, doing this work is one, uh, and not the only one, but one way of creating a, a counterpoint and an alternative to the total privatization of public life or its replacement by shopping. Um, the project is a proposal for an urban park, a national monument, on Ellis Island in New York Harbor. Over there, this Manhattan Island, and this red line marks uh, the outline of the crescent of uh, Liberty State Park, which is being built in New Jersey today. Ellis Island was the principal point of entry for immigrants to the United States between 1892 and 1954. Through its gates passed 16 million people, all of them poor, many of them displaced by political and economic events in their homelands to begin new lives in the new world. Today, the survivors among these immigrants and their descendants comprise nearly half of the United States population, 
an estimated 100 million out of 218.5 million. And that, in a sense, makes Ellis Island one of the most widely shared historical experiences of the American people. Ellis Island, as I said, is located in the New York Harbor, only a thousand yards away from the Statue of Liberty, and its area is roughly equivalent to five New York City blocks. It's divided into equal halves by a ferry slip. The main immigration station to your right in the northward half was designed by uh, the architects Boring and, and Tilton were the winners of the competition. The southwest side of the island contains, to your left, the main hospital building where immigrants were detained for medical or political reasons. And then beyond that, actually behind that, were the contagious disease wars formed by several separate pavilions connected by a covered corridor. After its closing in 1954, Ellis Island was declared surplus federal property and offered for public sale. And since then, proposals uh, for Ellis Island transformation have included, among others, a, a women's prison, a drug rehabilitation center, a home for the aged, a college, legalized gambling. Frank Lloyd Wright designed uh, a fragment of the city of tomorrow for Ellis Island. Philip Johnson designed a monument called the Wall of the 16 Million, where the idea was that the buildings in the island would allow to be ruined and to deteriorate and be taken over by, by the green, sort of romantic ruins, and then be surrounded by walkways from which people then could observe the ruins. Um, to the left, uh, the uh, contagious disease wars, which are unsalvageable at this point, would be, of course, removed and replaced by um, these um, this monument, um, which bears, I suppose, you know, very clear resemblances to uh, some of the architecture of the Enlightenment in the form of the cenotaph, um, and would have the names of the 16 million people who passed through Ellis Island inscribed on the outer wall. At the time when when it appeared, um, it was. Uh, it enjoyed a shortly but lively uh, polemic, uh, the project being rejected in a sense by the critics and the public on the basis of uh, its uh, intention and its image and its metaphor. That is to say, it very clearly evoke the image of the Tower of Babel, uh, which the, um, the public uh, feeling uh, sense was not the appropriate way to in a sense celebrate or or commemorate, um, a, you know, the the immigrants' contributions uh, to the United States. The island was declared a national monument in 1965, and it was placed under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service of the Department of the Interior whose policies have oscillated between a 1968 proposal to demolish all buildings except the immigration station and to transform the island into a green park and the current policy of conservation and selective reuse of the existing structures. In a sense, the development of Ellis Island is, is actually very important because it will become the centerpiece of uh, the crescent of uh, Liberty State Park. Uh, the park itself is expected to increase visitors by several million. In fact, there are plans for uh, trailer parks, uh, which it will ensure you know that. The diagram to the right uh, shows, in a sense, what is the uh, uh, a chronology of the uh, growth of the island from its original configuration in 1812 uh, to, and there is you know, one other stage to its present configuration um, during the uh, uh, 19th and, and uh, uh, 20th century. I'm not going to, I can't in fact, delve into the 
very particular transformations, but I just want to point out the main characteristics of each. This was for Gibson. Uh, the island itself was a pile of mud, you know, the, the only recognizable outline being the, for, the wall of the fort itself. It was built during the Civil War. And uh, eventually, um, uh, ammunitions and you know were continued to be stored um, uh, during during and after the Civil War. In 1890, um, Congress voted to remove the arsenal from Ellis Island and to also relocate the immigration depot from Castle Garden Battery Park to uh, Ellis. There were two intense public fears at, uh, at play here. One was the fear of the explosion of the um, uh, ammunition, which did happen in those days. And the other was, of course, the fear of the destitute immigrants arriving you know, right uh, into the main line. Uh, so that is what basically caused the appropriation of Ellis Island by Congress and its uh, augmentation to include not only the uh, buildings of the fort, but also this very large um, wooden building where 10,000 people a day could be processed. Now, as ir irony uh, would have it, and in, as a sort of befitting end to this paranoid attitude, I suppose the, uh, it could be seen this way, the two days after the inauguration of the building, a fire swept through Ellis Island and burned everything down. The immigration records, the buildings, uh, no one was actually killed in the fire, but they had to start all over again. And at this point, a competition is called, a close competition where some prestigious architects and some new architects are invited to, um, to redesign uh, the immigration station, which is going to be totally fireproofed at this point. The winning design was by the New York firm of Boring and, and Tilton, as I said before, who were the young guys and were quite influenced by the Bossart planning of the um, Great White City uh, depicted in Ch the Chicago Columbian Exposition. Um, the, uh, the island itself becomes a sort of platform for this quote unquote French Renaissance style building, which reminded one of, and in fact was patterned after uh, American train stations as the gateways to cities, and 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 the design of the building was patterned after, of course, um, uh, several different buildings from which, you know, the architects quoted extensively. Uh, Gare du Nord, the, the uh, electricity building of Van Front in the Chicago Lyman Exposition, and others. Um, from this point onwards. The island became, well, actually from this point onwards, because this was the built version of that Bossart plan, the island became a perennial non-stop construction site. Um, buildings were added as a result of improvisation and commissioners appropriating funds more than as a result of any kind of careful planning or studied uh, growth or anything like that. In fact, the um, uh, the the period when the island gets the most buildings is when it was non-functional as an immigration center. Okay. Mm. To the right is uh, what the island looks like today. In the main immigration building, uh, the original structures, powerhouse, uh, laundry and restaurant building, Ferry House replacement of an earlier one, a WPA building in the back, which was never used for any reason whatsoever, sort of dormitory building at later, and uh, the main hospital, which was built in three sections, that being the one for which the architects were responsible, and then um, more stuff that was added later on, at least respecting the original style of the building. And then these uh, contagious disease wars, which um, are uh, the, theory, the foundations are deteriorated beyond the point of any salvation. That uh, is a WPA recreation structure that was uh, added uh, rather late um, in the history of the place when 
when the island functioned as a sort of deportation center. The, uh, the island, as I said, was closed in, uh, in 1954. The project, the plan is on the right, on, the, on your left, I'm sorry, proposes the, um, I don't know if it can be focused a little bit better, uh, the transformation of Ellis Island, which was a place of hope and despair, into a place of remembrance and celebration. If this proposal was ever built, in a sense, the park would be the first to uh, celebrate in its design and proposed uses the plurality of influences which have shaped the civilization. One half of the island is retained as a museum. The immigration station left empty, silent, where names of every nationality were once shouted. As they leave the building through the low railroad extension, the visitors find themselves at the edge of a reflecting pool that follows the transported um, to the mainland. The, uh, the walkway above the, um, the wall functions as a vantage point, which is also accessible by ramps, right, from here and from there. Um, functions as a vantage point to view Manhattan and the Statue of Liberty, and in a sense then restoring to the prow-like shape its meaning as a carrier of an early memory of the site, which was for Gibson's garrison wall and gun battery. Only those buildings uh, in, that were part of Boring and Tilton's original composition remain. On the, um, um, opposite side of the island, across the ferry slip, the hospital building is uh, refurbished as a public place which houses the administration center for the study of American ancestry, one where visitors would have access to computer terminals to uh, sort of find out about their family's origins, and also a hostel. Uh, it is possible, of course, to walk um, through a forest uh, into the other uh, side of the island. And this forest, in a sense, stands as a reminder of the wilderness that these immigrants came to transform. In fact, the degree of transformation, I think, is most accurately depicted by these images, which are taken from little books that were handed to immigrants um, to convince them to immigrate. Um, and in four quick steps, it shows how the first years of hardship would uh, imply clearing the wilderness, then with more hard work and uh, you know, industry progress would be made and cultivations would begin and then eventually you know, orchards would grow and at the end of the story when these people finally made it, the wilderness is totally gone and uh, architecture appears, of course, <laughs> the neoclassical mansion. Um, so across the street, as I said, you know, the hospital building is redefined in that, in that way. Uh, the central green space in the middle would be used for um, special events and celebrations of ethnic and cultural groups for parades or pageants, concerts, festivals, games and picnics. And this place marks the intersection between the two major influences on American attitudes towards the landscape. That is to say, along this axis, it becomes a formal foreground uh, and forecourt space to a series of major formal moves, very much in in um, in a way that you know we could see uh, in 
in many American gardens like Villa Vizcaya and others um, of European, Italian and French Renaissance influence. But along this axis, it becomes a space that is more like the town and village green or the campus green, uh, a very different uh, kind of um, a, a space. Uh, in fact, a kind of a space that is probably best depicted by the lawn of the University of Virginia with the uh, important building at, at, uh, at its head. The focus of the, uh, I'm sorry, the focus of the garden opposite uh, the former hospital is an oval pool beyond these monumental stairs which can be entered through that passage. And this uh, pool uh, uh, has a 24 foot high waterfall around its edge. The monumental stairs flanking the entrance to the pool lead to the checkered terraces of paving and grass to either side, and these terraces then form a stadium to view the events occurring in the central green. They also lead to the upper terrace. In the upper terrace, there is a labyrinth garden which is formed by three patterns, and this labyrinth uh, is of course the archetypal form which is associated with the process and act of dwelling. The first pattern consists of um, 10 foot wide paths with trees and, and uh, seating areas leading to um, a new courtyards and um, uh, from one edge of the island uh, of the garden to the opposite is not to get lost is in fact to orient oneself within that space the second partner the uh, pattern is a huge labyrinth of um, paths that are about four feet wide and six feet high and the third pattern is a small turf maze uh, intended as a children's playground um, these are images which are not literal representations, but rather sort of like mnemonic devices to remind you of the kinds of spaces that I had in mind. Below the labyrinth garden is a building which is accessible from two entrance pavilions at either end, leading into entrance courtyards. And uh, a, these in turn lead to the interior, which is a, a simply a flexible pancake space defined by a 24 foot structural module. This building houses temporary and permanent exhibitions, display and seminar rooms of many ethnic regional um, organizations, including the American Museum of Immigration. The edge of the island facing the Statue of Liberty functions like a ship's deck lined with small ethnic restaurants and shops. Along this street, the visitors may pause and enjoy a sort of imaginary voyage. Uh, and it's possible to, to uh, go to the upper deck and relax and eat uh, there as well. And this street is only interrupted at the center behind the great waterfall where very large circular openings in the seawall recycle continuously the water that is pumped to make the waterfall in the first place. Either at their arrival or departure from the island, the visitors may stop at the restored Art Deco uh, ferry house, which is the visitor center where you buy the postcards and the souvenirs. Or they can participate in an event taking place at this building, which is the uh, transformed ruin of uh, that WPA recreation structure. This building is surrounded by a 45 degree berm which goes right to the um, uh, edge of the roof and one enters the building through an opening in the hearth itself. It is through the hearth that one 
uh, enters this buried building. The berm itself is covered by very small pine trees. Um, as one enters, the skylight above seals this buried building um, with light. And on a special occasions, and this is the, perhaps the most fanciful part of the project because the technology to make it happen uh, exists, but that could never be controlled. Um, very powerful water cannons at either end of the island shoot in, uh, spray into the air, causing a rainbow to form very fleetingly, another gateway, which I see basically as a metaphor for the renewal of hope. Uh, and I think that I would leave it at this. Uh, thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.